All right. So um, thank you all, first of all, for having me. I, I'm really excited about this evening um, and actually really to learn more about your program and all of the wonderful things that you're already involved in and you do. Um, just a little bit about me. I'm actually from St. Louis, Missouri. So I am back home at this point. I've been away from St. Louis for quite some time up until last year. Um, so it was just about 16 and a half years or so I was away. Um, my educational background, uh, I have a BS in chemistry from Fisk University. Uh, being from the St. Louis area, I know lots of people want to know. I attended Cardinal Ritter College Preparatory High School. Um, I've been with Anheuser-Busch for 23 years and a portion of that time was as an intern. Um, I started right out of high school as an intern with them and throughout undergrad. Some of the things I'm interested in is I really do like event planning outside of work, community service um, and traveling. You can kind of see a, a little bit of a picture of my career path. Uh, Anheuser-Busch has been my career for all of my working, like full-time career. Um, I did work at the school bookstore a little bit in college, but otherwise it's been with AB. Uh, so started as an intern specifically in quality. And I really thought that I wanted my career to be in research and development and really all laboratory work. But one thing that I did learn through my internship is I did enjoy that, but I wanted to do much more, which led me down a path and a um, career in brewing. So I left here um, in 2002 and went to the Newark, New Jersey brewery. And you can see I had quite a few positions there along the way. Um, and then to our Columbus, Ohio brewery, and then along back here to our St. Louis brewery, where one of my, um, what I would say is probably one of the pinnacle items of my career was becoming the St. Louis brewmaster from being an intern in the brewery uh, to brewmaster. And not only uh, that, but being the first female here, which is, um, I know a long ways to come. Uh, and some of the things that were pointed out in the documentary. Um, and not only that, being the first black um, brewmaster here at this brewery. So I did put together just a few highlights of my career just to make it a little more fun and exciting to, as I talk about it. So where I started in the research pilot brewery, that's our innovations brewery. And that's really truly where I learned to brew and still did a lot of my own laboratory work. So it was a really cool part of my career where I got to work on new products, um, still um, do laboratory work and then really learn how to apply. Um, so with sciences, such as everything and especially chemistry, but um, um, the application and the process. And really being kind of in between that biology physics um, realm where chemistry lives, it was really cool because I got to use a lot of that uh, throughout that part of uh, my career. Moving into the Newark, New Jersey brewery, um, I gained a lot more knowledge from a technical standpoint. Many of our brewmasters have food science backgrounds or engineering backgrounds, believe it or not. And so that was not necessarily um, something I had a ton of exposure to. So being a part of a lot of our innovations and startups, um, I learned a ton on the engineering side, really how to run projects um, and a lot of different things. So you can see some brand expansion, uh, even spending time with some of our consumers and, and teaching them about the beer process, the brewing process. A big part of what I do is people related. So I have teams of people. Um, I, I work with people that make the beer, people that supply us. Uh, but then also our consumers. So that's a huge part, regardless of what field I think folks uh, step into or go into, is really um, honing in those people skills as well. Um, and then with some of the things we do, benchmarking and best practices sharing across our different organizations to become as efficient as possible. It's a big part of uh, what I do as well. So along the way, I still worked on education for myself and the brewing industry. So one of the opportunities I had is we have a global brewmasters class. So I've traveled a bit uh, with our, our company um, to Leuven and to, um, so over in Belgium and Germany and had an opportunity to take one of the um, kind of higher level uh, tests to really understand your knowledge in brewing. And that is from the Institute of Brewing and Distilling. And so I have a certification um, from that organization for both uh, early side of brewing, fermentation, and also the food safety portions. Community service, as I mentioned, love to do that. So I always try to do it with my teams. We even touch things like um, from um, a standpoint of with the community, what are some of the connections when it comes to political arena? So we do work with a lot of our representatives and different process areas related to 
uh, what we call better world initiatives, but then also to things that support our business. So I've brewed with a couple of our senators and also um, representatives across the states. Um, and then one really cool piece, we just watched a documentary. I was, I was a part of a documentary just a couple of years ago. So if you ever have uh, a moment and you're interested, Kings of Beer is out there and it really talks about um, some of the things we do in the brewing process and really our commitment to quality and what it takes to um, make a, a very consistent beer. So last but not least, um, here was recently back in 2019 to 2020, um, I had an opportunity to meet a lot of women in the industry. And so not just the beer industry, but the alcohol industry in general. And I was actually in this organization um, with Kroger, the only woman that was in beer. Many of these other women are in wine or spirits, but it was a really awesome um, opportunity and just building that connection and networking across um, our industry and really understanding some of the challenges that all of us have gone through. So I'm gonna kind of wrap it up so I don't take too long, um, all the way to bringing to current. So some of the really cool and new things that are out there that we're involved in, some non-beer items. Uh, but most recently, probably the biggest thing that has happened in my career is I was awarded, or I should say named, um, so a legacy for me with my company, a scholarship fund uh, with the UNCF. So for the next five years, we do have a scholarship that's available for 25 students. Um, that uh, um, specifically for black students, because that is something that we still have a lot of work to do in our industry. Um, from a diversity standpoint, we don't have a lot of folks um, that span a, a different, and when I talk about diversity, definitely from a, a race standpoint or a color standpoint, but also just different backgrounds. Um, so we're looking to encourage that. So if you should you know, be looking for a scholarship as you go to college and, um, please look into that particular scholarship because we are interested in um, having new people join us. So a couple of things I just want to leave you guys with is one, um, and I know in the introduction, um, it was kind of said, I really encourage people to follow their passion. So really be true to who you are. And so for me, I absolutely love science, but also as a part of what I was really interested in is a bigger, broader spectrum of what that meant for me. Um, and so transitioning over to brewing science uh, was a big part of what has driven me, you know, in my career. And um, I think really helped me to kind of blossom and be who I wanted to be. What helped me do that was my internship. So as I, I acquired that internship and I utilized the time for four consecutive summers to spend time in a lab environment, to spend time, you know, in a leadership type of environment, it really helped to um, Un unveiled to me what I really wanted to do long term. I also want to tell people you should definitely dream, dream big, have the vision of what you want to do. So as an intern, you know, I did at some point throughout my undergrad career decide I would like to be a brewmaster and I, I continue to work towards that path. I asked the questions um, to get me to where I needed to be um, and, and really having great leadership and having mentors help me with that. I, I believe I was able to achieve that. It does take some bravery, so really being ambitious and sometimes saying yes to the things that are a little scary to you, um, but it puts you in a position to have those opportunities. Really being outside of your comfort zone here and there is where you grow, it's where you learn and where opportunities can arise, which also goes along with being agile. Um, so really allowing yourself to explore other things. Be inclusive, I think this is a key component. Um, I know from the documentary, you know, from just watching a lot of the things, you know, really hit home for me and was kind of crazy um, that women have, have dealt with so much uh, throughout just trying to pursue what they really want to do. And I think us understanding that being inclusive and every time you are operating in a team and environment, making sure you're valuing everybody that's part of that team and being inclusive to that team. I think it's so critical to be authentic. Um, it is tough. Um, it can be a little scary sometimes, especially when you think different, um, look different. You're in a space where um, it's apparent that you are different, but I think it's the best you that you can bring. And that authenticity is a, is a big part of making some of the best teams. And then last but not least is to be curious. Uh, so just being a lifelong learner, as I mentioned, you know, I, I came out of school with a specific focus and I've learned the entire time I've had my career. And I think that that helps tremendously, one, being open to learning, 
but also giving you an opportunity to be in positions that maybe you wouldn't have the opportunity to, to, to be in that position. Um, so that's what I wanted to share with you guys this evening. Thank you again for having me. I look forward to the questions. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much. And you know what, I'm going to minimize this. I think it's showing up in the screen. Um, what an amazing event to be a part of. I've got to tell you, I didn't prepare nearly such a beautiful presentation as we saw from Natalie, but I want to say a few things. First of all, um, that movie was uh, really something and I, there are so many things there to react to. I just want to say that I feel very fortunate um, to be a professor of chemistry, to have gone through a career with people who have been incredibly supportive of me, but also other women who act as allies for each other. And as disheartening as, and hurtful as so many of the stories are that we heard just now, I just want to say that um, maybe there are a wide range of experiences. And while I recognize many of uh, the things that uh, women referred to in this film, nevertheless, uh, I see a brighter future ahead for all of you. And that is because each generation of us that comes along tries to take better care of the generations coming behind us. So please, I just want to start off with that note. So my trajectory, um, I am not from St. Louis. I'm actually from California. And also my trajectory is different because my parents didn't grow up in the United States. So I'm a child of immigrants by, uh, by definition, actually. And also, I didn't have such an easy path into the sciences. I put myself through school at UC Berkeley as an undergraduate, and that gave me a certain kind of resilience, I think. I had to work during college to send money home at times, something that maybe other students can relate to. And that made me maybe somewhat tough to fight along this pathway towards getting to academia. And so I just have to say that my experiences might be multivaried, but they were not always the easiest path to go by. I'm gonna keep my remarks short because I really like the question and answer period and I'd like to focus on that. So let me just uh, share with you a couple of things of which I'm particularly proud. Maybe just to give you a little bit of a snapshot of what my world is like. So one thing I'd like to show you is this is my lab. And you know, my lab is, uh, it's almost like my child, if you can imagine. What you see here will probably be unfamiliar to you. It looks a little bit cluttered and with, you know, devices and wires hanging around. But what you see are these two round objects. That's like an MRI magnet, an MRI for people, except I don't do people. I work on rocks and semiconductors, as you heard. And so we stick samples into those magnets in order to look at them. On the rest of this setup is actually a laser and I shine laser light in. So imagine taking an MRI-like image, except we call it something else, we call it spectroscopy. And so I do that with the lasers on it. And this is one of only a couple of these types of devices worldwide. And we're very proud to have it in St. Louis. And I'm very lucky to be here at Washington University. Then let me show you something else I'm very proud of. Um, I'm sorry that it's getting cut off because of uh, some of the formatting issues, but this is a list of my researchers over the years. And so some are in blue because they were recent graduates, but you see there were postdoctoral associates. That's some, after you've gotten your PhD, this is sort of like a professor or a scientist in training before you go off to jobs, um, much like you saw in the movie that we just watched. And then I have a number of PhD students and um, they are like a family to me now, as well as undergraduate students and high school students, all of whom have done research. So in some sense, this is my academic family now. And uh, in addition to my own you know, family here at home with me. So I hope that we'll have a chance to uh, talk about some of these things together and if I can answer any questions. Anyway, I'm delighted to see so many of you um, on this call and uh, happy to meet other women scientists who are out there professionally in the field. And I'll stop there. My name is Boimo Dua Pong, um, or most people just call me Bo. Um, I currently work as a field bioinformatics scientist at Thermo Science, uh, Fisher Scientific. Um, but I'll give you a few slides about my beginning. 
So um, I am a twin. So I have a twin sister. Uh, we were born in Dallas, Texas and raised in Houston, Texas. Uh, my parents were both um, immigrants from Africa. So they're both from Ghana, West Africa. And we grew up here as one of the first, we're first generation. I have an older brother who also was born in Ghana and then he came here when he was about 10 years old. So this is more pictures of me and my twin sister um, enjoying life together um, after being born. And then this is just a picture of my, um, my brother um, and also my uncles who also immigrated um, to America um, when they were in their early teens as well. So my initial dreams when I was growing up, um, I really thought that as um, a running joke in the African community is very much all your parents ever want you to be as either a doctor or a lawyer. So I always assumed that I would grow up to become um, a medical doctor. And that was the only thing that I thought of when I was growing up, going to high school, and also when I was in college. Um, but my reality was that, hey, there are a lot of different things that are involved um, in order to become a medical doctor. Lots of different paths you can take. And also uh, becoming a medical doctor may not be the only path to take. So uh, at the end of the day, my question was like many of you here today is, how do I make my parents proud? How do I make my family proud? Um, and also additionally, how do I, as um, growing up in an immigrant family, um, single parent household as well, um, I was like, how do I make money in order to support my mom um, who is gonna grow old? Um, and then how do I support my family as well throughout my time in college and post-college? So when I was in high school, I did end up applying to one of my dream schools. So one of my dream schools, I actually visited the campus when I was in middle school. Um, and I had, I stepped foot on campus and knew that was the school that I wanted to go to. So my dream school was Rice University, which is located in Houston, Texas. So in middle school, I actually went to KIPP Academy. Um, if you have heard of KIPP Academy, um, the short, um, the acronym stands for Knowledge is Power program. So I went there from sixth grade all the way to eighth grade and graduated um, from the original KIPP school in Houston. There is a KIPP school in St. Louis now. Um, there are multiple now in, in St. Louis actually. And then last uh, two years ago, they've started the first KIPP high school um, in St. Louis. And so it's really great to see this huge network grow and continue to grow. Um, as a side note, my twin sister actually went back to become a teacher at KIPP, and then she ended up being the first uh, school leader of a, of, a KIPP school, of a KIPP graduate, as a KIPP graduate. So that's pretty cool to be able to uh, witness that her growth there. So after KIPP Academy, we both went to Asheville School, um, which is a boarding school in um, Asheville, North Carolina. Um, Many people think that if you go to boarding school, you have to have a lot of money um, growing up. But in actuality, there are a lot of um, scholarships and um, grants that you can apply for in order to go to high school, um, as well, go to a boarding school, I should say. And so KIPP Academy helped my family and multiple families um, apply for these grants and apply for this financial aid so that we could go to high schools um, like, like Asheville School. Afterwards, then I did end up applying to my dream school, um, Rice University, and I happened to uh, get admitted to that school. So when I was admitted there, I was asking myself um, as a first um, generation student, uh, I kept asking myself, what am I going to major in? Well, I always thought, you know, I'm gonna go ahead and go into medical school. So I might as well major in something ecology, something that's around biology. That was literally my, my first instinct. So I took, I retook biology because I already had AP credit, but luckily this is where, you know, things happen for a reason, honestly. Um, and then I ended up meeting one of my advisors that I've had for life. And so I ended up meeting um, Chandra Jack, who was a graduate student at the time. And then also my professor, Joan Strassman, who has been um, like the biggest supporter of mine throughout my entire schooling. And so without taking that biology course, I would have never met them. And I also would have never been able to do research on this cool organism called Dictyo 
Discordium. I'm not going to play the video for you all, but um, if you go on YouTube and you research this little organism, what you'll find is that these um, this organism will start as single cells. And then when they start to starve, they'll come together and form a slug and then form a fruiting body where 20% will live on and 80% will die. And so it was really cool to be able to do this type of research. And then I ended up um, being part of the authorship for a lot of papers that were published within the labs. So after that, I was like, well, I think I'm getting the hand of this like research scene. And so when I, when I was a senior uh, in college, my professor, Joan Strassman, was moving from Rice University to Washington University in St. Louis. And so she asked me, hey, you know, you don't know what you're going to do. What do you think? What are you thinking about doing, you know, post-college? And I said, I really, really don't know. I like research, but I, you know, I've got my, my mom telling me she wants me to be a future doctor. And she was like, well, why don't you take a year off? Come with me to St. Louis, work my lab for a year and see if you want to be a medical doctor or if you want to be a researcher. And then that uh, got me to move to St. Louis <laughs> from from Houston, Texas, and I got to work for a year um, at WashU. And so when I was exploring research, I figured out that um, I uh, ended up actually getting a grant called the National Science Foundation Research Fellowship um, as I was there for that year. And then I was like, well, I think I, I think I got the hang of this research thing, so I might as well go ahead and do it. So then I ended up, you know, getting rid of my um, idea of being a medical doctor and going on to graduate school um, and actually getting my PhD. And so within my PhD, I worked with uh, microbial communities. And as you all are well, are well aware of, microbial communities live in very every single different environment. And so these environments really interact a lot with each other. And so these are some of the type of research projects that we used to do when I was in graduate school. After finishing graduate school, I went ahead and went into industry and I worked as a data scientist at Bayer, um, which was formerly known as Monsanto. So I worked at Bayer Crop Science for about two and a half years, loved it, um, but felt like I could, I could grow more as a scientist. And so I decided to switch over to work for another science company called Thermo Fisher Scientific, where I started back in April. So I've only been there for a couple of months. Um, but I've already loved, I already love this new role. It really helps me uh, be able to uh, merge two of my skill sets together. I love talking, I love communicating with people and it allows me to actually be customer facing. So actually talk to people about science rather than sitting behind a desk and just coding away, which is what I was doing um, at my previous role. Um, so if you have any questions about any of this, um, I would be happy to answer them. Um, I'm so thankful to be here tonight. Thank you so much, Rose, for uh, inviting me here. And I'm looking forward to our conversation and our Q&A. Hello, Sophia, Bo, Natalie. Thank you so much for coming out to join us this evening. We really appreciate your taking the time to do this. Uh, we have a couple questions. I have a couple that were uh, sent to me uh, in particular. And the first one, is, uh, looks like it's open to all of you. Before you, uh, before you became a scientist, did you have a picture in your mind of what a typical scientist looked like? And if so, did that affect you as you were studying in school? I, I'll answer first, if that's okay. Um, for me, um, I was very, I was very much, influenced by scientists that I saw, which um, in the school that I was in for high school, I was exposed to black female scientists. In addition to that, my mom is a chemist. Um, so my vision of, I guess, what I thought a scientist was, was probably a little more blended um, than most because I, I, it wasn't like I went into an environment routinely to see scientists. However, media, television, you know, Bill Nye, the science guy, different things like that. But I did have um, a pretty healthy exposure to um, some diverse scientists. So what really influenced me was my mom. You know, she, she is a, um, I really didn't know initially when I was going to undergrad what I was going to study. Um, I too had a desire at one point thinking maybe I'll be a pediatrician. 
Um, so I follow the pre-med path. Um, but she told me if I, if I followed, I, I liked it. I was relatively good at it. Um, following science and choosing a discipline um, in science, I could do anything with that. And so I started down that path and thankfully I really did enjoy it. Um, and so I stuck with it. Any of our other panelists want to address that one? Nope. Okay, so we have another question. Uh, what are steps corporations in the United States can take to promote additional diversity and inclusion in their workplaces? Now that's a hard question. <laughs> Luckily, as a scientist, we get to work on easier problems than that one, which is more <laughs> sociological, to be completely honest. But there is much we can do, um, all sorts of you know, racial, ethnic, and uh, gender diversity, plus disability status. These are all things uh, we can work on as a community. And in part, um, I think you see a lot of types of awareness building, training to sort of make people aware that there is a problem. The, the film we saw tonight is a type of awareness building to show, for example, how pervasive this kind of sexual discrimination was um, in various science settings and showing how multiple groups used that awareness in order to affect change. And we're seeing similar efforts now at universities and in workplaces, basically to first recognize that there's a problem and then after that awareness is built in, then to create programs that try to address it, but it's a very slow moving thing. And it, to work, to affect that change, we need to work with this generation, all of you who are coming into the pipeline now. Anybody else? Any yeah, we'll have ideas. Any of our other panelists want to address that one? Okay. Uh, let's see. Did you have any science heroes or people of inspiration during your STEM journey? And that's to all of you. I'll take a stab at that one. <laughs> so I think for, for me, uh, my biggest hero, um, I kind of showed you a picture of her already, was uh, Joan Strassman. So she um, became a scientist during a time when there weren't a lot of women um, who were professors. Um, when she was growing up. And so seeing her prevail through that time period and then make herself available for me and a lot of my, um, a lot of my co-work, uh, or I should say my colleagues as well. Um, so one thing that, a story that I love to share um, about her is that uh, when I was in college, I was working about three different jobs and one of the jobs was working in her lab. And so she, um, I told her, you know, I couldn't spend a lot of hours um, in the lab because I had to spend time at my other job, which I was working as um, a uh, computer help desk person. So essentially I was fixing people's computers around campus. And so I told her, hey, well, you know, that's the highest paying job across all of campus. So I'm gonna put in more hours there than at this job here um, because that one will pay me more at the end of the day. And she looked at me, she's like, Bo, are you serious? Like, you're not gonna work here just because of the pay? And I was like, yes, this is a real thing. Um, and so then she um, went back and thought about it and she actually increased the amount of money she was giving per hour for every single student that was working in the lab um, because she wanted to ensure that that wasn't a, a reason why we didn't want to work at the lab was because we had to take time um, and work somewhere else for higher pay. So I, I mean, to this day, I'm so grateful for her to be doing that because again, that was money that she was receiving from grants, making sure that she could have enough for all of the students around. And then she saw that inequity there um, and made sure that that wouldn't be a reason why students couldn't work in her lab. Um, and without that experience, I doubt that I would have been able to apply for to the schools that I went to um, or even had even got, received the, the grant that I got um, when I was in graduate school. So um, she's definitely one of my heroes for sure. And somebody that um, is um, a professor that I, I 
am thankful and grateful that I, I was able to meet along my journey. Thank you. Sophia, Natalie, either one of you want to answer that one? Okay. Um, what else do we have up here? So uh, for those of you who teach, what tells you that one of your students is meant to be in a science field? What tells you that they are not meant to go into a field? I can answer uh, as a teacher, you know, um, I think the students who are meant to go into any science discipline that at least I've been exposed to are ones who are, are innately curious, excited to, you know, do this kind of learning, maybe not equally excited about every science class, but still having this curiosity about the world. There are some students that I meet on occasion where this is a stepping stone, the science classes to an end, and that end might be something outside of the sciences or maybe another professional trajectory, but you see people who love it and who just love being in lab or, you know, looking at a, a, a cellular organism <laughs> that fuses together in order to make, you know, some kind of new survival mechanism. I mean, that kind of excitement that Bo showed when she was talking about her science or Natalie with her brewing, you know, the, 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 those kinds of things just show that a scientist, I think, is often somebody who just gets enthusiastic about these detailed, uh, you know, descriptions of, of the world around us. So, um, you know, I know that we do a lot of STEM careers programming, and I know that we have a lot of students, that, middle school students in particular, who come through the STEM careers programming, and they, their initial thinking is that uh, science is not for them, even if they, there's something in the sciences that they like, because they think that they have to be uh, the top student in their class and or the best and or the brightest in order to pursue something in the sciences. Is that, is, um, is that something any of you um, would like to address or speak to? Oh, I would absolutely, I don't mean to take all the airtime, but I have to say this story. So I'm a professor of chemistry. So I've, let's say made it in some fashion, but I will be the first to tell all of you publicly and I tell my students this, sure, I got A's, but you know what? I got B's and I even got a few C's in college. And the point is that that didn't throw me off the pathway because I had to have that resilience to say, well, I'm not gonna be great at everything. And so just that recognition, it doesn't have to be all A's all the time. Yes, that opens some doors, but just know it doesn't mean failure. And so I hope that helps to hear. And I really struggled through organic chemistry. Just remember that, write it down. It was brutal. And so maybe that will make some of you feel better one day when you're in college. I think that's good. Uh, that's really good information for people to have. And, and one of the things I hear often is that um, a lot that, that girls often more so than boys will uh, drop a class when they're in college if they're not really doing well in that class, whereas uh, uh, somebody who's male might just go ahead and, and keep plowing through it and think, okay, I'm okay with a C or I'm okay with a D. But um, that that uh, thinking sometimes uh, prevents girls from going further in the sciences. So that's just an aside. Does anybody else want to speak to that? I was gonna say, I appreciate Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Natalie. <laughs> Dr. Hayes bringing that up because um, Organic was a class that I struggled with initially. Um, I, I entered into undergrad with a lot of AP courses. And so I tried to load up going in the freshman year, sophomore year, I was gonna graduate early, you know, and um, I bit off a lot. Uh, and I had to um, also, Rose, you just mentioned dropping a class. I was so determined to make sure that I had this, this great GPA, this wonderful, that I was uh, analyzing which classes um, I could keep, I was going to keep to get an A and then which class that I would retake and go to summer school. And my mom really helped talk me through, you know, um, be more realistic with my expectations and also taking time to make sure I wasn't so focused on the grade, but I was learning while I was in the class. Um, and I think that's the most important thing is one, 
if, if you want it and you're thirsty for it, stick with it. And just because it's your passion doesn't always mean it's going to be easy. Um, but then also too, being very realistic with um, giving yourself the space to learn while you're in those classes. And so I did a much better job my second go round <laughs> um, in selecting classes, but um, hindsight's always 2020. So when we talk about what are some of those things I would pass back, you know, to those that would be entering and following the STEM path is really giving yourself the space to learn why you, why you have those opportunities and ask all the questions and really immerse yourself, um, be a sponge in that environment. And truly your professors, when they say they have open hours and um, drop in time, they mean it. So, so use that. <laughs> I was just, um, you took the words right out of my mouth is the, <laughs> that, uh, that idea that um, the most important thing you can do in college and even in high school is to learn the material. Um, I don't mean to cram, I don't mean to memorize, it's to fall in love with it because a lot of that material are building blocks um, for these higher level classes that you will be taking in the future. And so I always tell my students, I'm not looking for an A. Uh, a B is great, but as long as you are understanding the material and soaking in that information, that's the most important part. I mean. I can tell you, I, I got C's in a lot of like a few of my science classes when I was in undergrad. Um, and at that moment of time, I felt defeated, but here I am with a PhD. So that C isn't going to stop you from getting to where you wanna go. It's the idea that understanding and just learning that material, taking your time, learning how, understanding how you learn and how you soak in material is like the number one, like most important thing you can do while you're young is to learn how do you learn? What's the best learning methods for you? Once when you figure that out and also figure out what is it that makes you excited, that gets you excited, then everything else will fall into place. But the most important thing is not to look at just your grades. <laughs> Don't look at just your grades, Under look for comprehension, look for understanding how do you learn? Are you, do you like to draw while you're like learning materials? Are you more of a, a, a auditory, a auditory learner? Are you more of a vision, visionary learner? So just understanding how you learn is like going to help you even more in, during college. Okay. Um, and since you answered this last question, we're gonna skip to this one. This one is directly for you, Bo, and it is, did your twin also feel the same pressure to become a doctor or lawyer? And did your twin ever affect any decisions that you made to become a scientist? That's a great question. Um, so I will say that my sister did also have the, the pressure. So my mom would sleep, uh, sing us to sleep and she would say, I'm gonna be her little doctor and my twin was gonna be her little lawyer. Um, so uh, she, uh, she ended up not going to law school and that was, I would have to say, a really hard time in our lives was her figuring out that, you know, law wasn't what she wanted to do. She kept taking the LSATs, trying to, to go that route and, you know, figured out this other route where she was a great teacher. Um, she excelled. I mean, she's one of the first Kipsters. Um, that is a school leader right now. And she's one of the youngest. So, I mean, she, she excelled in what she ended up doing, but no, she did not end up um, becoming a lawyer, but she did get pressured into it. Um, in terms of affecting my decision to become a scientist, um, we, it was weird. Like when we were growing up, uh, she actually was the one who had higher sc scores than me on almost everything. So um, I remember coming home one day and I had like a 95 or something. And my, my twin had like a 99 on the same thing. And my dad would look at me and go like, well, well I don't get it. Like, why did you not get that many points as your sister? So uh, she was actually the one that should have gone into, uh, into science if you were only looking at grades. Um, but I got into it because I was just super excited um, during our biology labs and um, looking up science facts. I was really uh, a big nerd in that area, I would have to say. Um, but yeah, so she, but, and also fun fact here is that she got her first teaching assignment um, for, she went through Teach for America. Uh, so when she got her first teaching assignment, it was for her to be a science teacher. 
And my family had a field day with that one. And they were like, wait, did they get the wrong twin? Because Boima is the one who's getting her PhD in science. And then they um, asked her to be a science teacher. Um, so it's definitely been been years of um, like sharing science activities. So we used to do like hands-on science activities that I would do around the St. Louis area. I would like share them with her so that she could do them with her students in school. And so that was where our connection um, really became stronger when I was in grad school and she was also teaching in science. So. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? So this one is as stated in the Kahoot, less than 30% of women are within the STEM fields. How has this directly impacted you? And did you fight against these societal norms? I guess I would just speak from the perspective, maybe from uh, definitely, uh, let's see how much am I gonna approach this? I, I guess the societal norm, um, one thing that I, I, I try to say like even to my daughter is not to live up to others' expectations, but your own. And so if you expect and you want, and you wanna go execute, then, then you drive and you do it. Um, unfortunately, throughout, um, really starting early on in undergrad, I started at one school and I transferred uh, to Fisk. And it was because I did have a run-in with my department head um, that was very unfavorable and had a lot to do with me being a woman and being black. Um, and it took me a long time to get comfortable with that, um, that I experienced it. And I was really shocked because I didn't think things like that happened um, anymore. Uh, and you know, for high school, I went to a predominantly black high school and everybody was in my corner and in my camp and encouraging me to do what I wanted to do and uh, helping me get scholarships and helping me uh, apply to schools. And so when I had this encounter, it actually took me a long time to even tell my mom um, because I thought it was me. I thought it was something wrong with me and, and this professor, maybe they were right. Um, and so that was the first time that someone had actually said to me, and it kind of struck me when I watched the documentary and some of the comments that were made, is that, wow, you know, I didn't think that that would help happen in a professional environment. So very similar to Dr. Hayes, I was very, I've been very fortunate to be a part of an organization that one, there were women that came ahead of me that helped really forge a path. But two, I had really great advocates, really great allies, really great leaders um, that have always been in my, my uh, court, my camp. As far as being a woman and especially a brewmaster and in my industry, when you look around, when you look up um, and, and textbooks, you don't see people that look like me. You see very few people of color and you don't see a lot of women, but that's changing. And we still have a long way to go. Um, but I think it's so important that one, because I like what I do and I'm passionate about it, that I make sure I keep doing the same thing to help other women be able to do what they want to do and that they're passionate about. So I don't know if that really answered the question, but one thing is what you expect of yourself, you live up to that and don't let anybody else deter you from that. I think that's a perfect answer. Does anybody else wanna weigh in? Okay, next question is, how do you think diversity enhances education and scientific discoveries? And that's to anyone who would like to answer it. I'll answer. Um, as a person from, uh, at least by appearance, from a majority group, even though I'm multiracial, uh, I'll just say that it's already been studied and shown that multiple perspectives lead to advancement. And so this has already been demonstrated by sociological studies. And so the only way that we're going to make, you know, big leaps in science and engineering and in STEM fields is by getting multiple perspectives and people to the table from a wide range of groups and you know whether they're cultural or ethnic or any type of association that you can imagine so we need as much diversity there to really make substantive advances and then we've got one last well it's two questions uh last question is what did you think about the film uh, that's one question. And then the second is, did you see any similarities between the women's stories and your own experiences as a woman in science? Looks 
what did you all think about the film? I think I already spoke to my feeling about the film in my introduction. I'd love to hear from, um, anyway, Bo or Natalie, so. I will say I was, I was very, um, I was taken aback, you know, I was really shocked. Um, I mentioned earlier that um, my mom is a chemist, but she did not get her um, chemistry degree until I was in high school. So she was a lab technician up until that point um, of which she went back to school and got her, her undergrad and then went on to get her master's, which was in uh, business management. But um, she did uh, pursue her, her, um, her chemistry degree because she wanted a particular position at work, a, a senior chemist position that was available. And she knew she needed to, you know, finish the, the studies to get it. But she exposed or, or shared with me a lot of different stories along her journey. And it really was reminiscent to me in the film of things that my mother used to share with me of her first day when she showed up to her, one of her, her uh, new jobs and uh, our new position. And if you should ever see my documentary, she tells this story in the documentary I'm in, but um, she walks into the lab and someone says the dishwasher is over there. And she said, why are you telling me where the dishwasher is? And they said, because aren't you the new dishwasher? She said, no, I'm the new technician starting in the lab. And it's various stories that she's told me across her career that that occurred. Mm -hmm. And when I watched that documentary today, and I still hear of a lot of those instances that have occurred in women's careers that, you know, far past where my mom has went through and lived. It, it, it's crazy to me. And it makes me, again, feel very fortunate to be in the position I am with my employer and the people that I've worked with that I have not had those same experiences. But it is it really was it was sad for me um, to, to see that. And I think it's unfortunate. And I think it just goes to show how much more work we have to do as a, a community, um, as, as other women that are in this field. But then also too, when I talk about advocates, um, really we need men to step up and help close that gap because we have to have them in places at, when they're at the table and having the conversation that we can't be a part of. It's so important that they are making sure they're, they're doing the right things for us together as, as whether it's for diversity or it's for inclusion, um, which spans so many different um, uh, makeups that that, that that is included in. So um, for me, it was just super impactful. I'm so glad I had the opportunity to see it. Um, and it makes me want to have a different conversation again with my daughter about just encouraging her and making sure she feels comfortable moving in her path that she wants to, to forge and that she knows she has people behind her. I'll add to that too, in terms of, um, unfortunately for me, it wasn't surprising to hear a lot of the stories that I heard on the film because of um, the stories that my friends have shared with me through, through their time in graduate school, um, going to Washington University in St. Louis, and then also with my stories that I've, I've had throughout my career as well. Um, so one story that it didn't happen in the lab setting, but um, it was close enough to it. Uh, my professor, Joan Strassman, she um, was uh, um, awarded a faculty chair position. And at the time, um, she got to have the ability to invite some people over to the faculty club, which is where all the faculty uh, members would have dinner. Um, and it's this really nice, like upscale restaurant that's in um, Clayton area. And so um, during dinner, I noticed that a lot of the waiters, um, waitresses were all black females. And so after the dinner, I walked onto the elevator and there was a man that walked on um, after he finished dinner in his room um, where he was. And he looked straight at me and said, oh, did you just get off of work? And I looked at him and said, um, no, I didn't get off of work. Um, he was like, oh, so then what are you, what are you doing here? And I was like, well, I'm actually, I didn't, and, and this is where I really didn't even respond. There was another, a male, a white male that was with us. He was one of the postdocs and he responded and said, she was here having dinner. She's a graduate school. She's a graduate student at Washington University in St. Louis. And she was here having dinner with a professor that went to the, um, that taught at the school. And he said, oh, you, you, you go to Wash U? What? Like, you're, in, you're getting your PhD and he just looked perplexed 
as if that is something that he's just seeing for the very first time ever. And so unfortunately those types of stories happen. Um, however, wh what was different, what was uh, a bright side to that story is my counterparts helping me um, and stepping in and talking to that man and explaining to him what was wrong, what was very wrong with this question. Um, but at the same time, unfortunately, that that does happen. And so what you do after having a moment like that um, is that didn't stop me from pursuing my PhD. And I hope that does not stop you if you ever have that encounter um, and within your within your life. Um, and the other thing is, hopefully that story is changing it, exactly what um, Sophia and Ali said. This is the reason why we we are here tonight. We want to influence you all and encourage you all and show you all that th we, this can happen and that you know all the barriers that are now right here right now can be broken down in the future. And the only way is by giving back and through outreach. And so I hope that after today, when you become successful and when you can share your stories, you turn around and um, say, hey, how do I go back into my community and do a lot of outreach and help inspire the next generation of um, women who are going to be in science. And so I hope that you all here are not only inspired, but also uh, feel the need to give back. Even as a teen, you can still give back. You can do science activities in your elementary school. You can do science activities with your brothers and sisters our cousins, it's, it's, it, you don't have to wait to have a PhD or you don't have to wait to be working in industry for 15 years to give back. You can always give back at whatever age um, that you're in. But again, just the idea that, you know, this is the reason why we're here tonight. And I hope that you all um, found this engaging. So thank you. Thank you, Bo. And maybe I could just add one thing to Bo's and Natalie's eloquent comments and they both made such, such important points. First off, these are such horrible experiences and it's just heart wrenching to think that uh, this kind of thing happens to people that we know and like and who are successful and wonderful scientists. Um, but remember, it only takes that one incident to give you sort of a sour taste in your mouth. Whereas many, many, many people in the community do not behave in this way but it's just that one outlier that kind of sticks with us, that we tell stories about. And what Bo and Natalie both mentioned is they had either strong role models or people around them that could help advocate for them. So be that advocate, be the bystander that can stand up and say, no, you know, that's not right until the norm shifts. And then we'll have a different kind of environment. So I think that they both made that point. And just remember most people around us in the sciences are really um, maybe largely not this way, but it's the outliers and the, you know, a few that might taint this, um, taint our experiences and not to let them drive us out of the field, drive you out of the field. So I'll leave it at that. I think that's good advice.